Hello, and welcome back to the Sussex Ontario Election Show. I'm Joe Ragusa, principal here at the firm, and uh, I lead the Ontario government relations business for Sussex. Um, thank you for coming back uh, on Friday again and uh, joining us as we talk about all things Ontario government, Ontario politics, and of course the upcoming Ontario election. For those of you that have watched before, you know that we've had uh, party leadership candidates and ultimately party leader on the show. We've had media representatives, we've had a cabinet minister, uh, as well as some of our own uh, subject matter experts. We thought it would be interesting now that we're in this post-budget period, uh, the Ontario budget having been tabled March 28th, that you might be interested in hearing from a candidate who's actually running in this upcoming election uh, that will take place on June 7th. We're happy today to be joined by the Liberal candidate for Humber River Black Creek, Deanna Scrow. Deanna, welcome. Thank you, Joe. Honored to be here. Deanna is uh, not only a candidate, but she's a first-time candidate uh, in this upcoming election, not having run before. So we thought you would really benefit from knowing what Deanna is hearing at the doors and in her riding, what people are saying, what she is saying, and uh, we will have people from, uh, as we promised, uh, pollsters, uh, media, different political parties, to bring you uh, as many perspectives as possible uh, during this uh, pre-election period. So Deanna, I know you've been very busy knocking on doors, and That's thanks for, for sure. coming. Thanks for coming downtown to uh, give us a bit of your time today. So you're the Liberal candidate in a riding called Humber River Black Creek, and for for people who may not know exactly where that is, can you tell our viewers where you're running? Sure. So thank you, Joe, for having me. And uh, regardless of how busy I am knocking on doors, happy to spend some time with you talking about what we're seeing, what we're feeling when we're knocking on doors. Humber River uh, Black Creek, formerly known as York West, uh, is the most northwest Toronto proper riding in Ontario. It's uh, bounded on the north by Steeles. It's Teals runs to Keele. If you think of York University, you'll get some perspective on that corner of the riding. It comes south all the way to the 401, cutting across Shepherd, Jane, and captures some of that area, and then is bounded uh, to the west by primarily Islington. Uh, it's, a, it's a very um, uh, it's a established community. It's been around for a long time, a lot of good schools, good community centers. Uh, people will recognize the uh, intersection of Jane and Finch, which is in the heart of my riding. Uh, we have uh, a very diverse uh, demographic group. Uh, I would say it is uh, statistically recognized as one of the poorest from an income perspective uh, and one of the most diverse. We do have a strong immigrant, immigrant base, uh, as well as uh, young working families, many young working families and uh, seniors. So I'm, I'm going to guess, because I know that part of the city a little bit, you, you have people that maybe immigrated here in the 50s and 60s, through the 70s and 80s, and you, you likely have some new, very new Canadians who haven't been here very long at all. Absolutely. Okay, so the diversity is an interesting perspective, both uh, in terms of cultural diversity, income diversity, and where people are on the socioeconomic spectrum. Mm -hmm. That's great. So we want to talk to you a little bit, and you were nominated when? In July. July, July of 2017, 2017, July 26th. Okay, so you've been out in the riding talking to your voters ever since then. Absolutely. So you, you would have been doing that uh, prior to the events in January, which led to the uh, eventual resignation of Patrick Brown, the PC leadership process, the selection of their new leader, Doug Ford, and the tabling of the provincial budget. So I want to just talk to you a little bit about uh, first, let, let's talk about the budget a little bit. So it, it is what I like to call the woman's budget because many of the signature initiatives in there which were about caring for children, uh, taking better care of our young people through the education system, special needs, pharmacare, and seniors. And even though it's 2018, most caregivers and most families are still women. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say. And I thought that there was a lot uh, in there that would appeal to um, not only the people directly involved, so if you're a person that was earning minimum wage, uh, you got a raise January 1st, and if the Liberals are re-elected on June 7th, you'll get another raise next January 1st. Yes. Um, and, and the pharmacare for kids, and really importantly, the daycare initiative. Mm -hmm. So in this ethnically and economically diverse writing that you're seeking to represent, how have these things been received? Have you, have you noticed the response to it? Are people asking you about it? Are you talking about it? I find it interesting that you call it a woman's budget. 
Uh, I'm going to beg to differ a little bit on yes. that. I, I call it a family budget. I call it a caring budget. Um, it certainly recognizes the disparity that we're seeing, the gender, uh, not just gender, but the gaps in uh, the income earners, in, and that's very obvious in my riding. We're right. seeing that with young families. What am I hearing at the doors? So pre the Brown-Ford situation, uh, we were looking at the minimum wage. That was sort of the primary uh, matter on the minds of my constituents. Uh, and it was a very, very positively received. Uh, they weren't necessarily thinking of the election prior to the Brown-Ford situation. Uh, and that, that has changed. So now when I'm canvassing, of course we're approaching June 7th, so it makes sense. But I'm very surprised at how many residents are aware of the election seem to me at the door to be engaged. I have a lot of young families, and I'm finding both parents, the father and the mother, very, very enthusiastic about this budget. Um, it has really, I, I guess I've knocked about, it was just last week. So in the course of the week, probably about 12 to 1,500 doors, had about 500 conversations, because I've been knocking every day. Uh, and for the most part, they've been very positive. We talk about the minimum wage. So that's impacted all areas of my community. And they're concerned about not getting that dollar extra on, uh, in January of 2019. And when we think about that, you know, a dollar, okay, is it significant, isn't it? It is significant. Every dollar we have put into the hands of lower income earners is dollars put back into our economy. Those consumers are spending, so that's beneficial for us. And my residents feel it in all ways. We now then turn to what has had the most impact at the door for me, uh, and I think because I have a lot of young families, is the daycare. So when we think about the Liberal government, the Liberal government was the government that introduced full day kindergarten. Right. And that had a direct impact on my families. So the families in my community, when their children approached kindergarten age, could make a decision as a family and as a couple as to whether both would go back to work. In my community, most families are two income earners. Both the father and mother are working and need to work in order to keep a roof over the head and food on the table and the basic necessities. So that is, um, is something that was received positively. So they know, they believe that this introduction of daycare for children two and a half and older will make a big difference. We're talking about an impact I'm an, I understand, of approximately $17,000 for families with children between the ages of two and a half and kindergarten. Per child. Yes, per, per child. child. In Toronto, so yeah. that's yeah. quite significant. So that's being received uh, with a lot of enthusiasm at the door. Good. And the pharmacare, I mean, they've, they've evened it out. So for those of you who may not uh, be absolutely current on this, on January 1st, any person under 25 years of age got their prescriptions covered by the province. There was a little bit of a, a, a difference in the plan for seniors because seniors had a $100 annual deductible and a $2 copay per prescription, and the provincial government has moved to level that out. So the seniors' plan will more closely resemble the, the PharmaCare for Youth plan. And I, I think that's fantastic. And again, that's an issue at my doors. Uh, so first and foremost, we were talking about the 25 and under. Uh, the impact on children. So families with two and three children under the age, typically in my riding, you know, eight and 12, 13, 14, there's no concern whatsoever about them not being able to go into the pharmacy or go visit a doctor, get a prescription, and ensure their child has a prescription. And if that's not imperative, I don't know what is. But now we're also addressing seniors. And again, we look at the Liberal government. It was the provincial Liberal government that first introduced a seniors ministry. It was the first government to recognize how important seniors are. And yes, they did have some pharma care coverage, but now they've taken it the full extent necessary to balance the 25 and under. We now have OHIP Plus for 65 and over, and as you've said, they've eliminated the, uh, the annual uh, amount that was required to be paid and the copay. So my seniors do appreciate that attention. There's also some other great things this budget has introduced. Uh, one of my favorite is the healthy home option, where, because I hear this, mm -hmm. you know, my seniors want to stay in their home. They've paid for their homes, they love their community, they're very integrated in the community, uh, and they have issues with shoveling their snow, getting their lawn mowed, and that $750 annual, annually will make a big difference for them. So I'm very proud of that aspect of the budget. I'm really pleased when we see... So when we talk about seniors, Joe, we're not just talking, in my opinion, about 
the population 65 plus. We're talking about all of us who are caring for our parents. And that's something I saw in this budget that made me quite happy. So we're seeing a commitment to more longer term care facilities, a commitment to more at home hours. As the daughter-in-law of uh, a, a wonderful man who is suffering from dementia, um, I know how important those at-home hours are. We want my father-in-law to be able to stay at home, and having that extra bit of support from the province makes it easier on all of us, my mother-in-law and us as children. So I'm, I'm very pleased when I hear the province uh, focus on care in a way that makes a difference for so many of us. Right, and I, I'm intrigued that you, you touched on some of the say, not so recent initiatives of, of the Liberal government. So one of the challenges that the Liberal Party faces in this election is this recurring theme of 15 years. They've been in power for 15 years. Now, you are a first-time candidate. So that 15 years, although your party can speak to it, um, you weren't there for it. But I, I've noticed that uh, perhaps there's a bit of a tendency amongst other Liberals, to shy away from, not talk about, uh, the, say, even the 10 years, because the Premier, Premier Wynne's been in, uh, the Premier for five, mm -hmm. and the party was in power for 10 years before that. Um, so it, it's interesting to hear you talk about some of those uh, accomplishments that happened uh, earlier years in, uh, in the Liberal government, and that's, you know, from a strategic perspective, I'm I, I would agree with you. I'm not sure why others don't talk about some of those accomplishments more. So you're seeing a positive impact. You're seeing a good response from your voters, your constituents on, uh, on the budget. Your opponents uh, have focused in, especially on the PC side, about a return to deficit. And this, this budget uh, has a deficit of about $6.7 billion. Mm -hmm. Are your voters raising that? Are people at the doors raising the deficit concern as something that's on their minds, that troubles them? I think that's a terrific question, Joe. and It's one that, that I was very curious about uh, when I was canvassing. So when I had someone at the door uh, where I felt we could have an engaging conversation, uh, I, you know, I reminded them that the Liberals do know how to balance a budget, and they did balance the budget, but they made a deliberate decision to run a deficit. And I asked how they felt about that. And on that conversation, perhaps I've only had a few with constituents, but surprisingly, they're very comfortable with it. And uh, I think they're comfortable with it because of the programs that are go alongside it, as well with the fact that the Liberal uh, Party has a plan to eliminate it within five to six years. So it is a very modest deficit. Uh, I guess we as Canadians are more comfortable with debt as long as relative to GDP it can be managed and we understand the need for investment. What I'm hearing that's somewhat interesting and changing in my opinion is a perspective from a group of people that there is a place for government in our lives. There's absolutely a need for good focused government. And we look at the disparity between the uh, levels of income earners and the struggles that some of our families are having, and they're appreciative of the government getting involved. And if the government, under the wonderful leadership of Finance Minister Charles Souza, makes a decision in an election year to run a modest deficit because they believe these programs are needed today. And we're not just talking about some of the care programs. What I'm focused on as well is the infrastructure and our investment in hospitals and our schools. I can tell you I have a number of schools that have been around for 50 years and they're in desperate need of repair. Some, in fact, should just be outright replaced. And this investment has to happen. And it's the right investment. It's the right decision. It's a deliberate decision by our government in an election year after a balanced budget to run a deficit. And I think for all the right reasons. And, and in, on infrastructure, certainly close to your riding, uh, we have a new Humber River Hospital yes. uh, that would be just south of your riding. I mm -hmm. think. Um, and there was an announcement in uh, your part of the city for a, a, an LRT line, I think that's going to run on Finch Avenue. Correct, yes. That work is underway on that one? Yes, well we've set up some offices. Metrolinx has offices for the community, for community engagement. And also, Joe, I have three subway stops. So that's phenomenal. And that was long overdue. And that happened, and you know, you talk about me raising our history as a Liberal Party. No government is perfect. No person is perfect. 
everyone makes mistakes. But boy, there are a few things we did really well. And one of them that I'm tremendously proud of is that subway. The extension of yes, the Yes, yes. I mean, I was a York student. I think you're a graduate of York as well. I can remember the days us talking about the subway, the subway, the subway. It was long overdue. It happened with a provincial liberal government, a federal liberal government, and a municipal government that cooperated. And the results are phenomenal for my students, for workers at York, and for people from the city of Vaughan. And when we talk about Humber Hospital, that's a fantastic facility, but it's not enough. So the other thing that I've been involved in personally is the McKenzie Health Hospital and the building of that. In Vaughan. In Vaughan. So, I mean, let's be honest, when you're sick, you go to the closest hospital, and that McKenzie Health Hospital will be actually just as close as the Humber Hospital. So we'll have two brand new facilities that are state of the art. We have a great healthcare system. We need to keep it great. Band-Aids aren't enough. And what we're seeing with that investment at Humber and at McKenzie Health and other hospitals and the commitment under this budget is imperative. And I'm, I'm pleased with it, very pleased. Okay, so we know that uh, the, the Liberal governments have made significant, I think the, the last number was 14 years and in the hundreds of billions of dollars infrastructure plan. Uh, we have it in our budget right up uh, for those that are interested. So there is some debt. Um, most of it this, in this last budget would be associated with the either enhancement of existing care programs or introduction of new ones. Um, and you've, you've talked about how people in your writing are responding to it. So you were a candidate and were canvassing prior to the tumultuous uh, chain of events with the PC party, which culminated uh, on March the 10th with Doug Ford being chosen leader and he is out there and doing his thing and the, the look let's be honest the the public opinion polls tell us that uh, to whichever extent he's resonating with uh, with some people in this province with uh, with his approach have you noticed in in your so starting in july of last year and coming into the winter and coming out of this winter if it ever ends um, has there been a change in people's responses? Are, are people in your writing talking about uh, the, the, the Doug Ford PC party? Is it in a good way, in a negative way? Or is it coming up at the door? Or? So Canadians are very friendly, and very polite. So you don't really get a lot of negative knocking at doors to many people's surprise. To my surprise, because I'm in a Toronto riding and I'm very, very close to where Ford has uh, his strength, his significant strength, as a you know former candidate for the mayor, uh, mayor's race, and in my riding uh, had strong support. The few people who've mentioned it, and I have to say they've been women, have said, I cannot support Ford. I look at it from a different perspective. My concern isn't about Ford per se. It's about the fact that we're eight weeks away from an election and I have no idea, honestly, I have really no good, comfortable idea as to what their platform is. And I am so afraid of them implementing cuts where we have made tremendous progress for my constituents and for residents throughout Ontario. So I really am anxious to have them introduce a platform, a costed platform like our budget, something that I can sink my teeth into, that I can consider, and that I can review for my constituents. So that when we're talking at the doors, it's not about Ford, it's not about when, it's about what's right for Ontario. It's not about 15 years. 15 years is irrelevant if 15 years today is good. If we've got good decisions, I say to my voters, don't vote change for the sake of change. Make the right decision. Make a, a, a costed, thoughtful decision. We're trying to engage youth. And if youth are going to get engaged, if millennials are going to get engaged, they want to understand the numbers. They don't want just talk. They don't want to hear just rhetoric. They want to understand your platform, what you stand for and why, and how you factored that in. How are you going to make us as Ontarians pay for these plans. Now, is there, a, is there a PC candidate nominated in your writing? Yes, there is. Is there an NDP candidate? There is, yes. Okay, so presumably they're out there also canvassing, doing what you're doing. Yes. For their campaigns, are, are you, have you become aware of what those two candidates are talking about in the absence of detailed platforms? Well, to my surprise, so my riding, just to give you some perspective, historically, uh, the challenge, at least provincially, has been from the NDP party. Uh, and so, 
you know, there, that's where I would ex suspect that I or expect to hear from voters that if they're not undecided that they're voting NDP. I'm really not hearing a lot about the NDP at all. What I am, to my surprise, hearing is a little bit more of the win Ford, uh, conservative liberal, and enough's enough. Um, what, are they, what are their strategies at the door? I, I can't tell you what the conservative strategy is. Uh, the NDP, I know they were focused a bit on uh, automobile insurance rates. Um, really, I don't think there's much that they can tackle into what we've introduced. I mean, it, you know, certainly we've heard uh, Horwath speak to wanting more and, and not supporting this budget. I find that very surprising. I think it's a fantastic uh, budget for the residents of my community. So I can't imagine my NDP candidate having much success attacking the budget that we've introduced. Uh, but I'm really not hearing a lot about the other parties' platforms. Certainly at the provincial level, uh, we have been hearing that when, when you look at not only the budget uh, initiatives, but things like the minimum wage, that um, uh, the, the, the PC party is saying that these, the Liberals are going too far, too fast. And the NDP are saying, I guess I should switch hands here, the NDP <laughs> are saying that it's not fast enough, not far enough. It can't happen soon enough and that they would do it more of it and faster. So we're going to come back to that. We're going to take a little break right now, okay. uh, which will allow all those people that are watching this at their desk to go uh, grab their lunch and we'll come right back Terrific. in a minute. For 20 years, Sussex Strategy Group has helped companies and organizations navigate government and bring about successful policy change. Our team of experts understand that it takes more than meetings and phone calls to turn heads and change opinion. It takes insight, strategy, and deep domain knowledge to get things done. In a world that's constantly changing, one thing stays the same. Sussex Strategy Group helps you win. Visit sussex-strategy.com right now and let us help you today. Sussex Strategy Group, 20 years of getting you results. Looking to take your digital advocacy to the next level? Get in touch with our team at Sussex Adrenaline. Sussex Adrenaline is Canada's most awarded digital public affairs agency. Using our proprietary advocacy platform, Vox, supporters of our clients' campaigns have sent over one million letters to their local politicians advocating for change. Let us help you design your next advocacy campaign and get the results you need to win. Sussex Adrenaline, digital that actually gets you results. Welcome back. We're joined today by Deanna Scrow, Liberal candidate in the riding of Humber River, Black Creek. And we've been having a discussion about how all of these themes and topics and budgets and uh, macro announcements are actually translating into uh, a riding here in the city of Toronto that is uh, economically, culturally and socially very diverse. So we've been getting some really interesting insights from Deanna as, uh, as to how people in her riding are, uh, are receiving all of this stuff. So just before we went to break, you talked about how in your riding in Humber River, Black Creek, which again, for people that f have followed Ontario politics traditionally, you might know it better as York West. Yes, yes. Uh, that was represented for a long time by Mario Sergio. Yes. Who is now retiring. Yes. Um, and so Mario managed to hold the riding um, for a long time. Uh, and it is interesting because you, your, your party is the incumbent party there, even though you're new. Yes. Um, and traditionally, you've had uh, kind of this liberal NDP dynamic, mm -hmm. where uh, province-wide, most of the attention goes to the the liberal conservative dynamic, and the NDP is present now. We had uh, uh, Adrian Batra uh, from The Sun uh, on uh, our show a few episodes ago, and she said, her words, that uh, Andrea Horvath needed to come out of the witness protection program or wherever it was she was hiding. Are you, are you finding that um, there, there's, do you expect that, that that liberal NDP dynamic will continue in your writing in this coming election? That's a very good question, Joe. We have, um, 
So when we talk about the NDP liberal dynamic, that's provincial only. So federally, the writing is exactly the same, exactly the same boundaries, but we don't see that dynamic. It tends to be conservative liberal, to my surprise. But uh, the uh, last two elections provincially, the same uh, individual ran for the NDP party and uh, did quite well. Um, but I think it's about the individual in that case, and I think that will be the case in this election because I think um, I think the NDP as a party themselves are, are somewhat silent. What I think will be a different dynamic this provincial election is the votes that the Ford leadership will take from the NDP candidate. So I think there will be some shifting conservative uh, because of the belief that Ford represents the, the hardworking small guy out there. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out on June 7th. Uh, it is traditionally a liberal uh, riding. Uh, the last provincial election uh, came quite close uh, in a split. We are working very hard. Uh, it is going very well when I'm canvassing, but that's for a variety of reasons, and it sure. is early. So, so we, we, we know from publicly available uh, polling that there are parts of the province where it's, it's just as likely to be a, a PC-NDP battle, say Niagara Region, for example. And there are, there are look, I, I, maybe not nice to hear as a liberal, but there are, there are parts of the province where the liberal numbers are, are pretty low. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see while, you know, the, Doug Ford has maintained this laser-like focus on uh, Kathleen Wynne and the liberals and Andrea Horvath is kind of two-thirds liberal, one-third she'll you know, take a shot at the PCs. Um, I'm kind of expecting that during the writ itself that we're going to see new dynamics. We're going to see, because there are parts of the province where I think that PC and NDP are competitive with each other, uh, and there are parts of the province where, like in your writing, where it's kind of a liberal NDP fight, and there are parts of the province where there's a liberal PC fight, that we're going to see, maybe for the first time, uh, this kind of three-way uh, dynamic going on, and um, I, it'll be curious how people like yourself, who are you know, focused on your writing, uh, have to have to deal with all of that. What do you expect right. from the NDP? I mean, your your party, the Liberal Party, has done pharmacare, you've done daycare, you've done. Dental. So much. Don't miss dental. We've got dental now for all families. So if you don't have a plan, you've got some coverage that you can use towards your dental care. I mean, that's fantastic. Do you, do you expect or anticipate that the NDP then will do those things and more? Well, where, where are they going to go in this election? You know, there has to be an element of fiscal responsibility. So at the end of the day, as much as my constituents are very seem to be uh, very, very pleased uh, with the Liberal commitment to care at a cost that they perceive to be acceptable, uh, I don't think that my residents would um, realistically expect or want uh, what has been suggested by the NDP. You know, there is a, a sort of a, a level of acceptance of government intervention and government support that all Ontarians, I think, support. Uh, but there is going to be a line. And I, if we look at today, I think the Liberals have met that line. I think anything further would probably be perceived as too much. Uh, and if that's what the NDP platform is, and certainly that's what the limited I've heard, uh, that's what they've suggested is we haven't gone far enough. Uh, I, I don't think that will be well received, even in my community. Okay, so there there are limits. People like the government helping out and stepping up, and you know it, the government uh, incurs some debt so that uh, mom and dad don't have to to pay for that childcare. Uh, it's a bit of a debt transfer, but um, you're saying that beyond that, I, I don't know what's left. I mean, I suppose. Full that dental there coverage. Are, yeah, there are some things like that we know that the government doesn't pay for 100% of everything in our health care system. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it seems to be trending that way. So let's talk a little bit in the, in the few minutes we have left. You know, I'm a, I'm a big Game of Thrones fan. And uh, I, I, for those who don't know, the, the, the show is kind of premised on the ruling families. And so we had... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, House Lannister and House Stark in the show, and certainly in Canada, the last uh, few years, we've seen uh, the Trudeau name that uh, mm -hmm. 
has uh, transcended generations. Uh, most recently, uh, the the Mulroney name, right? yes. Caroline, the yes. daughter of the former prime minister, seek the PC leadership. We have Doug Ford uh, and his late brother, the mayor uh, of Toronto. Um, and, and so we have this trend now of families who continue in the family business of politics. So it's no secret, your, your mother, Judy, uh, who's long-standing, highly respected uh, MP, uh, federal MP, represents Humber River, Black Creek. Yes. And you're running in the same riding. Now, I, I don't, you know, I, I'm only half kidding here. Do, do you feel that having, having grown up in it, that uh, you, you, you have an, an additional perspective that, say, if, if I ran for office, I'd be the first one in my family to do it. I'm not running for office, but if I were, <laughs> I'd be the first one. You should. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have, you know, that, the kind of pedigree uh, that you have. Do you find you have maybe an additional perspective on, on this line of work that, that others might not? And I'm not only talking about experience in elections. Yes. I'm talking about the business of actually being a representative, mm -hmm. of actually governing. What, well, that, what can you tell us about that? It's, it's interesting uh, that you ask the question and frame it in the way you do with Game of Thrones <laughs> and references to Trudeau and Mulroney. Certainly, um, Mum and I don't, uh, don't put ourselves in that category. As you know, uh, my mother's been a politician for over 30 years. But prior to that, uh, my mother was a mother. Uh, she's married to an immigrant. She always volunteered, so she was involved in our schools, our church, the Canadian Cancer Society, our local hospital. And I think when I think about my dynamic and my uh, deciding to follow the family footsteps of politics, it relates more to that. It relates more to what I've seen and how I've been raised and influenced by actions. So similar to my mom, I was a full-time worker, but obviously um, gave time, not obviously, but chose to give time to the various schools that my children attended, to the hospital that serviced my community, to um, the, uh, one of my favorite is Law Help Ontario. So to individuals who couldn't afford, uh, I'm a lawyer by education and occupation, and I was able through Law Help Ontario to volunteer once or twice a quarter in the small claims court and in the superior court for people who couldn't afford lawyers. And what I reflected on in, in doing those things is that as an individual, I was happiest when I was helping people. And I see that in my mom. So I don't look at, at uh, myself as having a particular um, advantage strictly because, uh, or perspective strictly because my mom is a politician, but I do see that her years of public service have influenced me. So her demonstrated actions have resonated with me and created a perspective uh, that applies to me in the way I want to live. And because of that, I believe that a politician is first elected for their constituents. And this is something that's resonated from my mom. Uh, first and foremost, if my constituents choose me, my uh, desire is to be their voice, to ensure that I am listening to their concerns and representing them at all stages possible. And that, to some degree, is a form of, of, uh, of volunteering, of giving back. I really see it as giving back. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, excited to follow uh, in my mother's footsteps. She's done a phenomenal job. What it also has done is shown me how much hard work is involved. Uh, if you do the job and you do it right and you're passionate about people, it involves a lot of time. And my mom has done a great job of giving me that perspective. So I have the advantage, I think, of knowing what to expect. Also seeing how I can impact people. You know, Joe, when I made the decision to run, uh, it involves family support and a sure. number of elements and giving up a career. And I thought about spending time with my mom in the community and how effective we could be together. And that was really motivating for me. Uh, I also thought about how incredible it would be to be able to help our constituents provincially and federally. And my mother can't get away from my phone call. So when I think about the family dynamics, it's really more close to home and focused to, on my constituents versus, uh, and, and sort of my life experiences. Yeah, and I have to think that when, when you were still living at home with, uh, with Judy, that you know, some of the dinner table conversations would be different 
than say for a lot of other families. If you know, if, if your mother has a federal MP and she was a minister yes, for a while, yes, citizenship and immigration. Uh, you know, could could come home and talk about you know I helped this family with this problem, and you know you get a kind of a feel pretty good about it. And I guess as a as a daughter, you'd feel pretty proud of that. And yeah. I wonder if that kind of it sticks with you as as you're growing up and you know you're raising your own family. There's this sort of I, I want to do that too. That was that, that was feeling, of, that feeling yeah. of giving back. You know, Mum wasn't ever one to really boast about her accomplishments, uh, and I knew she was special. I, I know my mother's been very much appreciated in my community, but my goodness, Joe, I hear it every day. I get at least one story, whether it's as simple as as sending a letter on a constituent's behalf, probably on an area not even federally related. Uh, the stories I hear, it's beautiful, and and my mum has created a legacy in that community and I'm so proud and I'm so proud and happy to be able to be experiencing it through my knocking on doors now as her daughter. Right. And you had obviously helped her on her campaigns before. Yes. Last question before we wrap up, is the experience of being a candidate yourself what you expected? Is it different than what you expected? Are you are you getting surprised? Tell us a little bit from a from a human perspective yeah, yeah. what it's and, like. And I can touch on that because, as you know, I have been very actively involved in my mother's campaigns um, because that's what family does. Uh, it is extremely different being a candidate. I'm I'm uh, I'm much more aware of the people who are helping me, the people who are coming to my office who I've never met before, who are taking the bus to come and help me knock on doors because they believe in me. And I feel such a, uh, a, a, a the extent of gratitude and appreciation I have for these people and that desire to ensure that I, I'm successful because these people are giving me their time. I didn't feel that pressure knocking on doors for my mom. I feel that pressure as a candidate. It's a good pressure. It's a positive pressure. I sometimes get overwhelmed. We do little rallies on Saturdays before we head out to the streets. And so I'll make a, a short speech. And it's not unusual for me to get a little emotional as I'm speaking because I look around the room and it's full, full of people who care about our province and about me and about our constituents and my community. And it's, it's really quite yeah. beautiful. Candidates often tell me over the years that it's, it's been a humbling experience. Whereas, you know, maybe people believe that you, know, you print up a piece of literature 40,000 times with your name and your picture on you put it all over the place you got your website you got signs that it's it's an, an ego feeder but in fact candidates especially first time candidates often talk about it's it's actually humbling it actually takes you down you know to, what that's, uh, to a level yes i would agree with that 100% yeah. it's really it's humbling and inspiring well that's great thank you for sharing the perspective of a, of a candidate, of a first-time candidate, yes, not someone yes. that's seeking re-election, uh, as to what it's like, as to what people are saying in the real world, not the rarefied air of downtown Toronto, about budgets, about initiatives, about programs, and what's important to them. So we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. On June the 7th. Thanks again for uh, joining us. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. And the most important thing I say to you, to everyone watching, and to all my constituents and all people in Ontario, vote. Vote. It's our election. It makes a difference. It matters. All right. There you have it. Thanks very much. We'll see you next week on the next episode of the Sussex Ontario Election Show.